Welcome to the first in a series of videos in which I, a board game enthusiast, attempt to reduce my board game collection by half. I'm going to explain my thinking as I decide what I'm going to keep and what's got to go. And it might help you think about what you like in a board game. But why am I doing this? Well, sometimes I forget that board games are for people to play. What do I mean? Well, too often I have bought a board game because it's a hot new release and there's a lot of buzz about it, but I haven't really thought through, hang on, is there somebody in my life that I would actually enjoy spending time with playing this board game? And uh, because that's happened many times, I have games on the shelf that there isn't actually anyone to play the game with. So let me show you this episode's games for consideration now. The Crew is actually a good example of what I'm talking about because it got rave reviews uh, when it came out and I'm sure it's an excellent game but it really fell flat whenever I got it to the table. I think part of the reason is that I forget to, when I'm watching YouTube videos of reviews of board games, I forget to like put on a filter, hang on, I'm watching young people in London or these like um, heavy strategy board gamer blokes who play Age of Steam three times a week in Midwest America. And I just forget to put that filter on saying, thinking, hang on, is this going to work for like the audience I'm playing with? And in the uh, pandemic, uh, I bought the crew and I was living in a bubble with my wife and her parents and it really didn't work. And why was that? Well, The Crew, it's a trick-taking card game. Uh, it's cooperative. It's all about communication, being on the same wavelength. It's actually quite a social game, but there's a lot of cleverness involved. You know, it's like, oh, why did you play the yellow five? Um, didn't you know when I played the uh, low red that I wanted you to lead and use your trump so that you would have the lead next time because we're trying to go for the blue seven and so on. So you can see that whenever I was uh, talking like that with um, my mother-in-law, she was just looking at me blankly and thinking, "What? how is this fun and when is this going to end? And also the game is like uh, structured as 50 different challenges. So, um, you know, with my wife's parents, they really expect a board game to begin and end within an hour and... Um, the idea of leaving it off and picking up at a later date is just not going to work with that kind of crowd. Unlike Azul, which was a total hit with my wife's family. This is a beautiful abstract game where you're picking up tiles and building a beautiful wall in a palace. Um, it's got really simple rules and it feels just lovely picking up the tiles and each turn you have to like scatter some into the middle of the table which is just a very sort of pleasing thing to do and uh, this is really a top seller board game of recent times so uh, highly recommend it to you it seems to work in every situation and the key is another time where I got it right because the reason why I bought this game was because I knew my wife's mum really liked detective fiction this game is about solving a murder mystery uh, and like the game Cluedo or Clue uh, this is a game of deduction but you know how in Cluedo, uh, if somebody guesses it right early on, then the game's over and you don't get a chance to make your accusation, but not so with the key. Everybody gets to finish and the winner is the person who does it using the fewest clues. Um, the way it works is there's this deck of clues and it gets chucked into the center of the table and you can like use as many clues as you want and you just do it at your own pace and you're only allowed to use one clue at a time, but you just work your way along. What was interesting was the first time we played this, uh, at the end of the game, there were hardly any clues left in the center of the table because we all like needed so many, so much help. And uh, then after playing it like six or seven times, there really were, uh, we were solving the cases just in using four or five clues at times, which was really fun because it felt like we were making just, it was such a learning curve. I knew that I had like absolutely smashed it whenever my uh, wife's mum asked to play it again and again. And finally, I want to talk to you about Sleeping Gods. Now, if you know anything about this game, uh, when I tell you that I bought it with my wife and her family in mind, you're gonna probably laugh at me because it's a game that takes about like 10 hours to play. 
But uh, let me explain. I had had a lot of success um, during the uh, pandemic playing this game called My City with my wife and her family. It was a huge success. Now, in the game My City, what they loved about it was that every game is a new story uh, because this is a legacy game and you open up these envelopes each time you play. And uh, it was the narrative that they really liked. So being a board game enthusiast, I thought, you know what? They would love a Red Raven game because Ryan Lowcutt, the designer, he's great at doing story-based games, isn't he? And I always wanted to try one. Now, Sleeping Gods was just out, uh, but it was going out of, out of print, uh, it was selling out. So I just snapped up a copy. And then whenever I broke it out with uh, my wife and her parents, of course, it was a total disaster because it was far too complex for them. It's got its own combat system. And the way it works is it's um, like a choose your own adventure game. Um, you think of those novels, you know, you're in a clearing. Will you go east or west? If you're going to go west, turn to page 64 and so on. And in this game, how it works is there is a book and with numbers and page numbers in it. And that, that's, so you use it in just the same way. But um, after you make certain choices and decisions, the game gives you these cards which are like markers and you start to collect them. And when then what happens, begins to happen is whenever you make certain choices further along in the game, the game asks you, do you have such and such a marker? Or do you have this keyword? And so the game gets to know like where you've been and uh, what you've been doing and previous choices that you've made. So the story sort of develops in this individual way as you are playing a game and roaming around this world, which is absolutely fantastic, but just in my circumstances was totally wrong for my group. And uh, another issue with that was, I think um, some people said the game was a bit hard and their crew got killed off quite early in the story each time. So they recommended um, giving you a lot of money at the start to spend in the shop, but it meant that you actually spent like 45 minutes um, shopping in this um, for these goods and weapons and armor to protect you before the game actually started. So um, that was a bit of a, that made it a very difficult sell for my wife and her family. And now it's that time in the video where I'm gonna decide what I'm going to keep and what's got to go. Uh, you can probably discern that Sleeping Gods has got to go. Um, I'm sure it's a great game. It's just I don't have the group to play it with. And also the crew as well. Likewise, that's going to have to go because it didn't work with my wife and her family. Uh, Azul, on the other hand, if I give that away, I would be in the doghouse. So that is get, that's one I'm going to definitely have to keep. And as for the key, even though that was a smash hit, uh, we've sort of played it out. So I can, I think I'm ready to let that one go as well. Now it's my goal in these videos to keep fewer than half of my board games. Uh, I want to keep less than 50% of the volume. And in today's video, I just decided to keep Azul out of this lot. So that's just actually a quarter of the, the volume. So I'm well on progress to my target based on this video. But next time I'm going to be making some more difficult decisions as I look at some heavy strategy board games. Join me in that video. I'll see you then.